In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our fathers and dear faithful, we find ourselves now again winding down the last of another successful 40 hours. It's a very interesting thing that we are able to do here because it is something that not every parish is capable of doing. In fact, many parishes sadly aren't able or don't do 40 hours. It seems to them at times too much of a task to take on and for some, especially those smaller missions, it certainly would be. And so when it is heard about that we have our 40 hours each and every year and that each year we find ourselves completing it with with great success and without anything in the way of difficulty, people oftentimes ask me, well, how many people do you have at St. Hugh of Lincoln to be able to make the 40 hours devotion? And I tell them an approximation of a number, and oftentimes it's interesting to watch their faces because it becomes a look of surprise. Surprise that a, a church that has a relatively small number of people is able to, without hesitation, and each and every year, have such a devotion of 40 hours, which takes so much time and effort. They are surprised. Me, I'm not surprised by it in the least. I don't wonder if our hours will be covered each and every year. I don't worry if we will be able to have enough servers for the Mass. I'm not concerned to think if the choir will be available to sing for each of the meeting, uh, each of the Masses. I don't stay up at night worrying about these things because I know that we have a chapel here where our people recognize the great heavenly treasure that we have upon our altar. We, we know exactly whom we adore. We know exactly who it is who we process with in our Eucharistic procession. We come together to ensure that such a blessing as a 40 hours devotion is a reality not once, but again and again, each and every single year. I don't feel the need to stand up here weeks in advance and conjole you and to try to guilt you into coming together and making use of your generous offerings of time and efforts to make this a reality. I schedule it, I organize it, and I know that it will take place. And I say all of this not for a sense of creating complacency. I don't want us to merely dwell on the fact that we do good and that we are successful. But it does need to be recognized that what we do each year in doing this is good and it is successful. And it is inspirational to others that hear about it. And it is something that we should be proud of, our ability to be able to do. But more importantly, I make this as a point to point to something even more important. What is the purpose of our 40 hours at the end of the day? It is not meant to be something in which we walk around afterwards and pat ourselves on the back floor and say, boy, we did a really great job again, didn't we? No. 40 hours serves a purpose. It is meant to be a springboard. A springboard of devotion fostered in our hearts, a love of the Eucharist, the King there upon our altar, and something that is meant to be strengthened each year and reminded of each year so that when we leave here today, we go out more devoted than we had begun 
this week. That we remind ourselves that we need to take this and carry it on forward and continue the good work that is done by our honor and love of Christ truly present there upon our altars. To see the greatness of the opportunities of our masses, your chances for different times of adoration throughout the year, and your great opportunities for frequent Holy Communions. And this type of reflection is one that is not meant merely for your own benefit. Of course, we know all of these things to be important for the sanctification of our souls. We know that all of this and more that is offered here is done all for a purpose, so that one day we may enjoy the treasures of heaven for eternity. But what is even more important than that is that what we foster by a 40 hours devotion is a true love of God. And such a reality, it cannot be kept selfishly. It cannot be something we merely hold on to for ourselves, but rather realize that that love of God there upon our altar, that opportunity to serve him through our masses and adoration and communions, that this is to be radiated outward and to be given for the good of all around us. Each Friday, if you come to the Friday evening devotions, we repeat with our benediction a series of prayers in honor of our Lord's holy face. And as you go through them, one such prayer comes from the hand of the venerable Leo de Pont. It's interesting because it stands in there amongst prayers from popes and from saints and from apparitions. And then there is this man whom many know very little about. But this man, a layman, he was a man of great devotion and had great influence on society around him. Leo de Pont lived in the time of post-revolutionary France. And he saw the country in which he loved, his homeland, transformed from one that was a great stronghold of Catholic faith to suddenly be turned around upon its head and become very secular and to become very much independent from God and at often times antagonistic towards him. All around him in society, men heaped insults blasphemies, offenses, and indifferences upon God. And Leo de Pont, he would not stand for it. He made it his own life's mission to combat this evil and to turn France back around again and to return it to the faith that it once knew and to return God to his rightful place of honor. But you look at it through our own lens now. And we can easily see, in looking at this lane, what a task that would be. Because we oftentimes have that same feeling for ourselves. What can a single man do? The whole of society around him seems to crumble. And he seems to stand alone by himself. What good can actually be done? How much influence can be gained? How can he begin to change society? These same questions certainly ran through the minds of Leo de Pont. How do I do good? Is it by voting? Perhaps do I organize some sort of rally? Maybe I put on my carriage a catchy slogan on a bumper sticker. No, of course not. None of these would really do any good. But instead, he recognized in society 
that it had become a purely natural society, one focused on only the goods of the temporal and no longer caring for the eternal. And so he knew to make change, he had to combat that which was natural in interest with actions that were supernatural in nature. And so he did exactly this. And one of the most important parts to it was that he placed his zeal in Eucharistic devotion. He made a change within himself, and he made it a point of his regular life that any opportunity that he had where he was able to attend a Mass, he would go even if it meant at times sacrificing his time. And whenever the opportunity was available for him to receive Holy Communion, he ensured that he was ready to do so and quickly availed himself of it. It is said that whenever he traveled, he regularly fasted all throughout the time of his travel because it wasn't known that perhaps during that travel he might happen upon a church that may be having mass and that opportunity for receiving communion he didn't want to go to waste even though he did, couldn't predict whether or not it would happen and so during his travels he fasted to ensure he was always ready to make holy communion if possible moreover with these frequent communions and opportunities where he attends Mass, he combined with it this mindset that every time he went to Mass, included in his intentions, was reparation, the offenses given from all around him. And that in every single communion that he received, it wasn't purely for his own benefit, but rather to make amends, to repair the damage done to society by those with wicked ends. Leo de Pont said of all of this, he said, reparation is a work destined to save society. And he believed it wholeheartedly, and he applied himself to it with such vigor all his days. To these things, he began to as well add as acts of reparation regular visits to the Blessed Sacrament to make acts of adoration. He developed for himself in that city of Tours where he lived, he started to begin that on a regular basis each month there would be offered in his, the local church opportunity for nighttime adoration that the priest was in agreement and he would help him out and he would expose the Blessed Sacrament and it would be made available there for people to come and adore. And it would be uh, out for adoration all through the night. Many people thought that this was overambitious and perhaps reaching too far. Some mocked him. Some faithful even doubted that any good would come from him. They told him society was too far gone. And they told him he was just one man and that things were hopeless and that he need not spend all his nights covering the adoration because they doubted few would come to assist him and to take hours off his hands. But the Ponte never questioned it and he continued onwards and each month there was a nightly adoration. His good example and his instruction in times of catechism for adults that he offered had soon began to bear fruits. Others couldn't help but be moved by it. It is said that he went from being almost entirely alone in that first effort of maintaining a night-long adoration to two months later finding that there were 74 more men who joined him to offer holy hours throughout the night. This devotion 
grew in Tours. And then that example there inspired other churches and other towns to do likewise. And Leo de Pont, whatever expenses were needed for candles and for, for lighting and for whatever might be necessary, being a man who had some means, he funded these things and he spread word about it. And slowly but surely, one little society, a church, and a town, and a time, began to grow in devotion, and to make reparation, and to regain souls for God. That is the spirit that we take from our 40 hours. It is the reminder that all these treasures, not merely our own, but they are at our disposal for us to make use of, for us to devote ourselves to, for us to make efforts in adoration and love to the true Eucharistic God, not merely for ourselves, but to do some good in the world around us, to gain souls one at a time, to be a beacon of a light in a world that oftentimes seems so dark. We, we cut out the noise of the world and find the quiet here in the sanctuary so that others may realize that that noise is just that, a distraction from what really matters. We receive our Lord in Holy Communion, not only that he may dwell within us, not only that the graces may strengthen our souls and sanctify us and lead us to our own reward, but rather we add to that acts of reparation, for those who deny him, for those who would spit upon him, for those who mock him. We begin our march after Mass outside and along the sidewalk in acts of adoration publicly made known for those who continue to slumber and don't even dare look out their window to realize their creator walking by them. Where others deny, we will recognize, we will appreciate, and we will love. And that love cannot contain itself, but the goods procured by it, especially when coupled with the infinite love of God, will radiate out and it will spread and that is how we will do good in our world. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.